kind of feel like I got a sneeze here. Here it comes. <coughs> That's what's up. Um, it's funny how you can feel that happen before it happens. All right, we talked about sugar lipids. Now we're talking about some proteins. We're going to talk about their function, what they're built out of, how they fold. And then we're going to talk about meat. Uh, proteins function. They are tiny little nanomachines. And I've shown those little videos of them doing little specific cellular jobs. So what are some of the things that they're involved with? Proteins are involved with uh, structure. So they help build structural components, structure themselves. Uh, they also make our muscles. They make our muscles. For example, they provide us protection. Protection. Uh, immune function. So they defend us from microbes and viruses. They um, are enzymes. So they're involved in metabolism. So they help build us and break down us and our food. Uh, they're involved in transport. And this is a pretty good list. Oh yeah, also regulation, signaling, signaling, things like that. Communication. They do everything. They also copy our DNA and things like that, which is part of uh, metabolism. They help break things down and build things for us also. Build things for us. So that's the function of these tiny little nanomachines. It's pretty crazy. All right, what the heck are these things? What are they built out of? What is a protein? What is all this? What are these terms? None of this makes sense. I mean, proteins literally walk around like we do, like little human beings. It's pretty crazy. All right, so what are they built out of? What are proteins made out of? Um, you know, and this, let me just pull up a, that image that I've kind of showed a bunch here. We've got, you know, I'll bring this up now. I actually should have brought this up in the beginning, but I forgot to. These are all our little macromolecules. Uh, and we've got DNA, protein, lipids, polysaccharides, and these are actually kind of to scale. Uh, I made these figures a while back. And, you know, we got these, this is actually two different types of proteins. We got these, they could be really any three dimensional shape that you want them to be. Uh, but they're made out of a tiny little um, mer, a little unit, and you make a polymer out of it. What are proteins made out of? Proteins are made out of amino acids. What does that mean? Well, we got we got a little amino acid here. This is a little amino acid. Looks something like this. And we'll redraw this little uh, this little thing out. Let me flop back here to my little notes. Okay, so we've got a couple of different groups here. Let me actually, so this is what amino acids are made out of. And let me just kind of redraw this out in a very simple, very, very simple kind of way to digest. So in the center of an amino acid, we got a carbon. And then coming off the side here, we got a nitrogen uh, and two hydrogens bound to that, of course. We got H two N. Okay, something like that. Over here, we got a carbon, two oxygens, and a hydrogen. And then we got, of course, our other little hydrogen here. And then we got something coming down here. It's a special group. It's different for every amino acid. It's called an R group. Um, and you can just think of the R group as uh, that looks a little weird. It's like, stands for the rest 
of the molecule. Um, and every amino acid has a different R group, and there are 20 different types of amino acids found in living organisms. 20 different types of amino acids found in living organisms. So it's called an amino acid. That's because this is called an amine group in chemistry. Amino group. And this is an acidic group. Um, carboxyl is another group for it, or another name for it, carboxylic acid. But you can just think of this as the acidic group. So it's an amino acid, acidic group. Um, so that's why they're called amino acids. So you, this is the subunit, and I'm just going to draw these as like little spheres kind of through the rest of this. But they have these special R groups like that. Okay, so what are, what are these R groups? I'm not going to draw them all out, but I'll pull up this little chart. You don't have to draw these all out either. But I just want to show you what they look like. And I don't have any of my labels coming with this. That's unfortunate. Um, but that's okay. That's totally fine. We got the carbon skeletons here. So this is the uh, amine group. This is the acid group. This is that little hydrogen coming up off the top. And then each one of these little colored sections is the different R groups. You can see how different they can be. They can have rings in them. They can actually connect back to the amine group, the amino group. They can be long carbon chains. They can be branched carbon chains. They can have various ring structures. And these all have different properties. Um, Uh, so these would all actually be, for example, these would be hydrophobic. These would be polar. And then these are ionic, ionized. So these would actually have a charge. These would have an a charge. So these would be ions. Pretty pretty nifty. So they could have very different properties, like hydrophobic, polar, and these would have a actual charge, like an ion, like salt. Uh, okay, that's what proteins are made out of. And we can link proteins together with that same, or amino acids, sorry. We can link amino acids together with that same reaction that we talked about at the very beginning, which is a dehydration reaction. So amino acids, Amino acids can be linked together with a dehydration reaction. Okay, so we can dehydrate the um, hydrogen here and the OH from here on a different molecule and link a bunch of amino acids together. Uh, and the way that looks is something like this. So we could have, uh, I drew these in blue. We'll just draw them all like this. So we got a couple amino acids here. Doot, doot, doot. Floating around. So we do a bunch of dehydration reactions on these. And then, you guessed it, I'm just going to recopy these. We can link all of these together. Like this. And we can draw a little line through them just to show that they are actually linked, like so. Okay. So dehydration reaction. And there's a very specific enzyme that does all this with RNA as well, dehydration reaction that actually makes this, it's called a ribosome. The site of protein synthesis. A ribosome is an, an is an enzyme is the enzyme that builds proteins. It's the site of protein synthesis. Ribosome is the enzyme that builds proteins. Okay. Dehydration reaction. Beautiful. We got our now. 
We've got a little special thing going on here. So now we've gone from amino acids, amino acids, to a peptide. That's what that's called, because this little thing here, that's a peptide bond. Thing that links uh, amino acids together is called a peptide bond. Now let's say we take this, we link even more of them together and more of them together and more of them together. So this, this ribosome been busy, been linking these guys together. Now we got ourselves something a little crazy going on here. We got a bunch of amino acids linked together. Um, it's more than just a peptide now. Any guesses as to what this would be called? I bet you can guess it. So just a peptide. No, this bad boy, a poly peptide. That's what's up. It's got many. Remember this poly means many peptides. And this is called a peptide because it has a peptide bond. Uh, phew, phew. Okay. All right, so now each one of these these guys, if you remember this, they're going to have this own little specific R group. That one's going to have an R group. This one's going to have an R group. Maybe those ones, those two are the same. Maybe this one's a pink R group. Maybe this one's a this color blue. Maybe this one's a red R group. Maybe this one's an orange R group. So on and so forth. And each one of those R groups has different properties, right? Each amino acid, each amino acid has its special R group. And the R group gives the amino acid special properties, like being hydrophobic, polar, or charged. There's other properties too, but those are like the three main ones that we group them up by. All right, not all that's spelled right, but I don't, I don't really care, I'll be honest. You know what I'm trying to say. Okay, so these different R groups are gonna interact with each other. Like maybe this blue R really likes this orange R, and so then maybe what'll happen is a little something like this kind of redraw this part out like this and bring it down and then maybe what happens is so like I'm not I don't know I'm not I don't know if I'm gonna do this perfectly but I'm just gonna fudge it uh, it's the one right after the big one let's just say something like that uh, okay so now this guy loop around doo -doo 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 -doo, and it was like We'll say like, I don't know, we'll say like this R maybe interacts with that R. I don't, I don't know if those this is accurate or anything like that, but let's just do it for example's sake. And I need to make this all a little. And all these other R's like to interact with each other. So like this one, I'm not gonna draw them all, but that one is now interacting with this one. Like maybe there's some kind of attraction here. Maybe some hydrogen bonding is occurring or something like that, or an ionic kind of bonding is occurring. And so that's gonna cause this peptide, this polypeptide to fold back on itself. Okay, that's pretty nifty. All right, and when it does that, it can build some special structures. So let's just kind of make a simplified version of this now where I don't have to draw out all these little dots. So some folding occurs. Folding occurs as R groups interact with each other. Pretty cool. Just again, based on chemistry, the chemical properties of these R groups is what's causing them to interact with each other. Okay. Um, and this will just occur more and more and more. And I'm going to draw like a bigger polypeptide here. 
So let's say at this section here of the polypeptide, let's say like we got like a, we got that initial fold. Let's say it just keeps going. It's longer and then it loops back like this and then it loops back and then maybe it loops back once more. And then over here, maybe it does like a little, a little, uh, eh, let me, oh, no. Maybe it's kind of loosey goosey there. And then it does like a, a, a helix kind of shape like this. Pretty cool. And then maybe it kind of loosey gooseys like that. And then maybe it's another helix. These helices actually kind of like fit in with each other. And then it's kind of loosey goosey. And then it comes back up and then maybe we got more kind of back and forth stuff like this, like so, and then it's like a little loosey goosey tail. Okay, so now we got a pretty definite little, some structures here going on. It's pretty cool. When we got this kind of back and forth folding like this, back and forth folding, where they interact tightly with each other. It's called a beta sheet. They interact very closely with each other. They loop back and forth and they all just kind of are very strongly bound to each other. When they loop like this, do -do 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 -do, they form these little helices. This is called a alpha helix. This would also be, up here would be an alpha helix. And this also here would be a beta sheet. So we have two beta sheets and two alpha helices in this protein. And then these would be unstructured reg run regions. Unstructured regions. That would be an unstructured region. This would be an unstructured region. Unstructured region. So this would be considered a uh, second, these are considered s secondary structures. Um, so this is considered primary structure. Primary structure of a protein is the amino acid sequence. So the sequence of amino acids is the primary structure. Secondary structure is the um, it's actually hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding, forming beta sheets and alpha helices. Helices, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen structure. Okay, that's secondary structure. Tertiary structure is up next. And so let's say now there's some more folding that occurs, like maybe this part here, like flops over this part and binds to it. Um, so let's kind of like think about what that would look like. And it's three dimensional. So like right now, this is all flat. We got these alpha heel, we got these beta sheets and then like loops around. We got the alpha helices. So maybe now it goes something like that. And so these beta sheets are now kind of down at the bottom. And we're going to draw this as like a space fill, kind of like what this thing would look like if it was actually folded. Um, so it's going to have like this little loopy part up the top. I don't like, I'm not like doing this like super accurate or anything. So don't like, don't freak out if this is a little confusing. So, and it's kind of like lumpy here where the alpha helices is. And it's got this little part where it comes around. And then it's got this alpha helices, but then those beta sheets flopped over it. And they kind of come down like that. There's that little unstructured region. And this is all beta sheet. And then it kind of comes back up like this. And so maybe this is now the three dimensional structure of our protein. So I kind of flopped that beta sheet down. I flopped this down and just kind of mirrored it down here. If that makes sense, this should probably be a little longer. Maybe I can extend this 
this little unstructured region out like that. All right, so maybe like this is an enzyme. Oops, I lost that little part. You know, just like um, if you remember way back here, this thing was an enzyme it has a specific shape and it's going to bind to these things and smush them together to do this dehydration reaction, right? This enzyme will have a specific shape to bring two molecules together to speed up the reaction. Enzymes are almost always proteins and it's made this specific shape. So maybe there's something that like fits right in here, some little molecule that gets chewed up and broken down and then maybe we get two of them or something like that. Okay, so this now three-dimensional structure is called the tertiary, which is just a fancy word for third. So we have primary, primary, secondary, tertiary, tertiary structure. This word just means third. Like don't be, don't be confused by this word. This just means third. The primary, secondary means two. This means two, and primary means one. Okay, don't be confused by that. Tertiary structure is is the 3, 3D, three-dimensional functional structure of the protein. So now it can do its little job. It's the proper shape. All right, pretty cool, pretty nifty. I'm digging it, I'm feeling it. Okay, so now sometimes these, these proteins will then interact with another protein. Not all proteins do this. But now maybe in order to function, this guy also needs to interact with another three-dimensional protein. And we'll draw him in pink. And maybe that actually fits in like this. And it kind of like, I don't know, loops around like that. It looks kind of like a little mushroom. And um, I kind of wanted him to be on the, on the bottom. So I don't know how to do that. In this program uh, but that's fine let's see if I can just find a little spot for him something like that maybe and then maybe also like this guy needs to come in here also and he like he he hugs that boy and he hugs this boy he kind of looks like a little embryo all right pretty cool a lot of proteins do this um, they work together with other proteins to actually build themselves. So this would be a quaternary, quaternary structure. Quan, quan, I don't know how to spell that. Quant, quaternary, that's it, that's it. Quaternary structure. So this just means fourth. This means four. Quaternary structure is multiple, is multiple. Why is that not? Oh, that's an E. Quaternary. Multiple 3D proteins coming together to do a function. All right, pretty nifty. All right, so that's quaternary structure. I could have looked at it right there. I have it written down. All right, that's it on proteins. I want to show a little video. Well, actually, let me show you this little picture. So proteins need to have a very specific shape, and they need they need that specific shape in order to do their function. Um, so when you cook an egg, oh, I got one more thing I want to cover too. So when you cook an egg, this part of the egg here is protein, this clear part. This yellow part is the yolk. This is lipid. This is protein. You now know what those are. This is actually a specific protein called albumin. It is a complete protein, which means it contains high contents of all 20 types of amino acids. That's what a complete dietary protein is. It contains a complete dietary protein contains high sources of all 20 amino acids. Pretty cool. 
What you're doing when you actually cook an egg is you're denaturing the protein. When you cook an egg, when you cook an egg, you are denaturing the protein. What does that mean? Denaturing. Unfolding. You're taking it out of its natural state. You are unfolding the protein. All right, what does that matter? Why does it why does it go from clear to now white? What's going on there? Is it just magic? Explain the universe to me, Dr. Arnold, I shall. So what you're doing when you cook a protein is you're taking it from this three-dimensional state. You're heating it up so it's all wiggly and it's unfolding. It's unraveling. It's getting excited. It says, forget these hydrogen bonds in my alpha helices and my pleated sheets. Let's be free and loose. I got so much energy. See you, buddy. I'm gone. And so now it's in this state. All right. So now we've got our albumin, our egg protein, in this primary structure state. And we don't just have one. We got freaking quadrillions of them, trillions of them. All right. And now they all start interacting with each other. And they're real sticky because they got these R groups. And now they form this big giant paste. They're all solid and stuck together. They're unfolded, just sticking to each other, kind of like butter did. Boom, boom. They're just all over the place like this. And so now they start to reflect light and they reflect all light because they form this giant mass rather than being this nice little three-dimensional protein that was happy to be in water by itself not interacting with other proteins. Like there's one there, and then there's one over here, and they're floating around in solution. So this is at lower temp. At low temp, or like body temp, proteins will be folded. And they'll be in their tertiary structure. At high temps, proteins unfold and stick to one another. All right, that's a little thing about eggs. Now I want to draw a cow. And we want to talk about protein in the diet. Eggs are a complete protein. You could just only eat eggs and that would that could be your only source of protein that you ever eat. Soybeans, also a complete protein. You could only eat soybeans or eggs and that would be all the protein that you ever need ever as a human being. You make 11, is it nine or 11? I'm actually forgetting now. I need to look that up. I, my brain cannot remember which one is which. Uh, essential amino acids. Let me look this up just because I cannot remember. Uh, how many essential amino acids are there? I'm pretty sure it's a little, it's, it's nine. Probably wrong. Yeah, there are nine essential amino acids, meaning you make, I had it right, you make 11 amino acids from scratch. I mean, you, you don't need anything to make them from scratch. You make 11 amino acids from scratch. Meaning, you, you can make them out of nothing. You don't need to eat protein to make those. Your body can synthesize them. Meaning, there are only nine amino acids you need to consume because you can't make the, them on your own. Okay? All right, and so this idea that you have to eat meat in order to get protein is erroneous. That was one of the promises that we were gonna talk about at the top, was that you need to eat meat in order to get protein. Protein is meat. I mean, protein is meat, 
but you don't need to eat protein or eat meat to get protein. You don't need to eat meat to get protein. You don't need to eat meat to get protein. And I'm just going to, I'm going to prove that to you. I mean, cows have slightly different biology. We're going to draw. I don't even, I actually don't know how to draw the essence of a cow. That is definitely not it. This is definitely not it either, but this is, this is going to be my dog. <laughs> oh, bro, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> that is not a cow. I got to adjust that. Oh boy. I'm going to draw it. Actually, that's actually kind of funny. I like that. Look at this thing. And then we got his little cow head. I really don't know how to draw a cow. It's bad. All right, but that's this is my cow. That's his cow tail. Here's his cow eyes. Um, the point being, that's his cow eye. Here's some cow spots. This is obviously a cow. I'm obviously a cow. And what do we eat cows, right? What comes from cows? Cows, they don't make that. Right, we get delicious steaks, right? Delicious steaks come from cows. Steaks come from cows. All right, so that's meat. Steaks come from cows. And what do cows eat? Here it is. Cows eat grass. I mean, if they're eating the right stuff. Cows eat grass. So if anybody tells you you need to eat meat in order to get protein, just be like, where, where did that, that, where did that meat get its protein from? Did it eat meat? Did cows eat meat? No, they ate freaking grass, people. What is wrong with you? you? Don't understand anything about how the world works and you want to tell me how to eat? Why don't you get a PhD in biology? It's pretty fun. You can see the world in pretty interesting ways. Okay. Uh, everybody go enjoy a steak and, or, or go eat some grass, whatever your preference is. <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys. We're going to talk about nucleic acids, and I promise it'll be a short one.